News Talk 98.9 welcomes you to our new Four County Area local podcast series. And our first contributor is Carolyn. And her podcast is Widow in the Up North Woods, living in the Asable River Valley after losing your spouse. to figure out how to make the next 30 years the best years of my life. Hello, I'm Carolyn, and I'm a widow. It does kind of sound like an Alcoholics Anonymous introduction. That one word says it all, widow. I was once part of something bigger than myself. I was a significant other. I was a partner, and now I'm not. Maybe we should start a Widows Anonymous group and have meetings. But kidding aside, these podcasts are just meant to be a form of encouragement. They're not a number of steps. They won't tell you how to move through the grief. There won't be lists of things that you must do. These podcasts are just my stories. And through these stories, I hope that you can feel a little less alone, a little stronger, know that you're enough, and that your situation is unique. Most of all, remember that you're allowed to do things your way. That Up North Feeling, Episode 5. Being up north is a feeling as well as a destination. If you live here like I do, at some point in your life, you and your husband made a choice to live here. Maybe it was the woods themselves, the opportunity to go four-wheeling, hunting, fishing, hiking, or snowmobiling. Maybe it was that your neighbors were right on top of you in the city, and they're not so close here. Maybe it was your retirement dream to move north. But maybe it wasn't your dream at all. It was something that you were doing, something you went along with, because it was your husband's dream. Sadly, that dream may not make sense anymore. When people move north from the city and suburbs, it's usually because they vacationed up north. It may have been a lifelong dream, but the dreams were probably summer dreams, and summer in northern Michigan is easy and fun. The big lakes, the inland lakes, rivers, fishing, boating, and swimming, campouts, bonfires, so many opportunities to make great memories. But a week in the summer, or a few weekends in the fall or winter, is a bit different than living here year-round. Most of the summer cottages in the northeast side of the state are just that. They were built as summer cottages. While some are fancy, most are modest and quite old. Some were never really built with year-round living in mind, but gradually converted for winter use. Many are modular homes, some of which were never really designed for the coldest winter weather. I'm lucky in that regard. My husband was a retired carpenter, and he was very particular about the house we bought. It's not fancy, but it was definitely built as a year-round home. It's a single story. It has two by six walls. Those walls allow for extra insulation. It has excellent thermopane windows, no water pipes on the outside walls, a modern propane furnace, and a wood stove capable of heating the whole house. It's a good, solid house. If it wasn't, I don't think I could stay. We moved up north in November of 2019. We didn't sell the house downstate till June of 2020, and finally we had everything in the new house, garage, and barn. December of 2020, I became a widow. I had a beautiful little house deep in the woods up north, but I no longer had the most important part of our dream of living up north. Before I got married, I was a camp director in charge of a large camp program, as well as nine buildings on 160 acres. I did everything from driving the old 9N tractor, replacing the distributor cap, I figured how hard can it be, just a few bolts and wires, I didn't know you needed to label the wires. I used the tractor to clear the road. I'd hook you up the brush hog to mow the trails. I hung upside down in the septic tank to replace the pump with my 11-year-old son sitting on my legs to make sure I didn't fall in. I replaced toilet innards. I soldered copper pipes that burst. I hung drywall, glazed broken windows, wired smoke alarms, dealt with raccoons in the ceilings, and mice in the camp kitchen. 
I did it all until one summer I was given money to hire a maintenance man. He'd show up smiling each day. I'd hand him a list. He'd tackle it. And if he saw something else that needed to be done, he'd do that too. Or he'd let me know and we'd make plans for the repairs. At the end of the summer, he asked me out. Three years later, we were married. He rescued me from having to do everything myself. I became a widow in December, so January was filled with immediate tasks related to his death. My income was cut in half. The household maintenance and repairs were solely my responsibility. The equipment maintenance and repairs was my responsibility. And if I didn't keep things in good repair, they wouldn't last. And I may not have the money to replace them. If you've ever moved to a new home, it takes a while to get really settled in. Due to COVID and my husband's rapidly declining health, we dealt with things as they came. We'd lived in our previous home for 20 years. We knew what needed to be done. We knew when the septic would need pumping. We had a pretty good idea of how long the water heater would last. We knew which windows would need plastic in the winter. And we knew when to pull the boat out of the water. Owning a home means there'll always be seasonal tasks that need to be done. Maintenance on the house and outbuildings, needed upgrades, and things that will break down and need to be repaired. All those things will require you to make decisions. During my first year of being a widow, I managed each crisis as it arose. But I also learned to start making plans so that everything didn't feel like such a crisis. I didn't have enough knowledge about the house or even living up north to be able to plan ahead, but I could start keeping track of things. I know my husband hadn't done it this way. He had always known from experience what needed to be done. He was retired and had more time to deal with things, and I gladly let him take on the responsibility. But now, it's my sole responsibility. Many things depend on having the equipment you need to do the job, November to March, I need to be able to plow the snow off the driveway. That requires the tractor and the blade to be on the four-wheeler. November to March, you need a warm place to fix things. That requires the propane heater or the kerosene heater for the barn. In the spring, I need to rototill to prepare the garden. April through November, I need to be able to mow, and that requires the zero-turn mower, the push mower, and the weed whacker. All year round, but especially in the winter and spring, I need to be able to clear the trees off the road, and that requires the tractor and the chainsaw. Tractor, zero turn, push mower, weed whacker, leaf blower, rotor tiller, power washer, chainsaws, one, two, three, and four, propane heater, kerosene heater. So I started a maintenance log. Do you remember those notebook dividers we used in high school? A different color for each subject? A notebook divided into sections and one section for each piece of equipment that needed to be maintained would be a really big help. I could have used my phone, but since women's clothing don't have ample pockets, I lose it a lot. My husband was not only my partner, but he kept track of my keys and my cell phone. I really miss hollering at him. Have you seen my keys? Have you seen my phone? So now I have a maintenance log in the barn where I faithfully write everything down that I need to do or have done to each piece of equipment. When my grandson or my son comes to visit, I hand them the equipment maintenance log. Diesel gas, regular gas, kerosene, propane, gas oil mix, bar oil, mower air filter, chainsaw air filters, oil filters, hydraulic fluid, transmission fluid, brake fluid, power steering fluid, carburetor cleaner, seven different kinds of park spark plugs, mower blades, chainsaw blades, weed whacker string, and at least three cans of starter fluid, one for the barn, garage, and shed. Ugh, I realized that I also need a supply list. At the top of the list it reads, if you use it up, write it down. When my kids come in the summer, they're a great help, but more often than not, they forget to tell me the gas cans are empty. They use the last of the bar oil, or they use the last of the oil additive for the gas oil mix. My husband would notice these things. Like grocery staples, he knew when to buy it, but I have to be told. There's nothing more frustrating than realizing the tractor needs oil and it'll take me over an hour round trip to get a quart of oil only to realize when I get back home I needed four quarts. 
with all these necessary supplies, I'm so confused. Oil's the worst. I didn't realize there was anything other than 10W40 or 5W30. What kind do you buy? What type do I need? How much do I need? What size do I need? Is it for summer or winter use? I recently needed to get a gallon of bar oil and grab the orange container just like the ones I've always seen in the barn. Then I saw the same brand in a gray container. It said specifically for winter use. Well, I am living up north now and it's just seven degrees for the high today, so I put both in my cart. I do have owner's manuals for each piece of equipment that we've bought over the years. I even have a five pound manual for the tractor. But first, you have to get through all those warnings and safety precautions. I know I'm not the most knowledgeable about all of our outdoor equipment, but please, I'm not stupid. I do know that you need to remove the cardboard packing material before using the propane heater. So I thought about spending a couple of days this winter going through the manuals for each piece of equipment to make a supply list. <laughs> that would take days, and part numbers from 15 years ago may not do me much good anyways. But I have discovered a secret weapon, the camera on my phone. Whether I'm stocking up on supplies, trying to figure out how to fix something, or planning for routine maintenance, I never take anything apart, go to the hardware, auto parts, or tractor supply without pictures on my phone. I've taken pictures of each piece of equipment, pictures of the model and serial numbers. I take pictures of the information on the motor, the actual part I need to replace, the numbers on the tires, the tread, the place the oil is leaking from, the container I just used up, the piece that's broken and where it came from. I have pictures of the boxes from three different types of chainsaw blades. I have pictures of spark plugs. I have pictures of just about everything I might need to buy to keep my equipment running. Photos in hand, I head out to get the stuff I need. But the hardware sends me to the auto parts store, who sends me to the tractor supply store, who sends me to the outdoor equipment store. I hate running from place to place. I just want to take care of the equipment so it runs when I need it. And up north, running from place to place can take hours. I can try to call ahead, but sometimes I just have a picture on my phone to work with, and I don't know exactly what I'm asking for. So now on my supply list, I've started to add notes about who has what. I know that the closest hardware is good with nuts and bolts, but they're not the most helpful when I need information. So depending on what I may need, I might drive a bit farther for it. Most of my battery power tools are DeWalt, so I know which hardware carries DeWalt. I know there are two steel dealers in the area to help with my chainsaw, leaf blower, and weed whip, but one is really good for basic parts, the other is really good for information and service. I know that the oil for the four-wheeler from the auto parts store is cheaper than the stuff at the power sports dealer. I know that Walmart carries the gas stabilizer and the oil additive for the gas oil mix, but it's not always cheaper than my auto parts store. I'm getting better at this. I'm now on the mailing list for every auto parts, tractor supply, and hardware store in the surrounding area, and I'm watching the ads for things I need for my equipment, the same way I used to do for with groceries when I was feeding a family of six. And coming up next, feed it to the dog. I'm unable to cook for just one. I've been planning and cooking and serving meals for 45 years, but grocery shopping and cooking for one is harder than it is for a crowd of family and friends. Listening to a locally up north podcast from a local citizen in our four county community. If you're interested and have a podcast idea, please contact us by sending us a personal message on Facebook, News Talk 989.